summer 1940, and a young RAF pilot takes these remarkable images using a camera gun fitted to his Spitfire. Heinkel bombers, an explosion, a man on a parachute. But what's the story behind them? The wing leader team began their own mission to find out. Luckily, at the very beginning of this camera gun sequence, some vital clues appear. Pilot Officer Miller, 609 Squadron. Rogers Freeman Garland Miller was a young Spitfire pilot who was, unsurprisingly perhaps, given the easier nickname Mick after the famous Greyhound of the day. Mick had joined 609 Squadron just four months earlier and had already shot down two enemy aircraft and damaged three others before his 20th birthday. So what was Mick Miller filming on the 25th of September 1940? Well, we know that 609 Squadron was based in the southwest of England and there was a big raid in that area on that day. At 11am, British radar stations first detected an incoming raid over the English Channel. It was 30 miles from the French coast at Cherbourg and seemed to be heading towards the important Royal Navy base at Portland. Of course, the raid was just a blip on the cathode ray tube at the RDF station. There was no way of telling how many aircraft or where they were bound, but this was far away from the Luftwaffe's usual targets near London. Now, this raid caught the RAF controllers completely by surprise. They had no idea what the target was. So what they did, they scrambled a couple of squadrons just to head to the coast to where the raid was plotted to cross, which was at Portland. As the raid reached the English coast, the aircraft suddenly split up. Now there were four raids. One turned west to Plymouth, another east to Portsmouth, both important bases for the Royal Navy. A third raid bombed Portland itself. The fourth raid crossed the English coast but then disappeared from the screens as the radar system could only look out to sea. The controller now had to rely on sightings telephoned to him by the Observer Corps as the bombers flew further inland. But a layer of cloud obscured the raid and they had to estimate the raid's progress by the sound of the engines alone. The controller now guessed the target to be Yeovil and its Westland Aircraft Factory. So the controllers scrambled two more squadrons and diverted the two that were airborne towards Yeovil. But by the time they got there, the enemy formation had gone further inland and was now about 10 miles away, heading for Bristol. There was now no doubt. The target was the Bristol Aircraft Company factory at Filton, where Blenheim and Bowfighter aircraft were made, as well as the Hercules engines that powered them. The Heinkels dropped their bombs in tight formation and devastated the factory. Luckily, the air raid sirens went off about 15 minutes before and lots of people got to the shelters before the bombs fell. But several of the shelters were hit. 82 people were killed and another 170 were badly injured. Horace Darley and his 609 Squadron pilots caught the bombers just after they dropped their bombs on the aircraft factory. They were now fleeing south for the English coast, a daunting 20 minutes away. Soon, all 41 fighter pilots were engaged in a rolling battle with over 100 enemy aircraft. Heinkel 111 bombers and Messerschmitt 110 fighters. Mick Miller was flying in red section, behind his commanding officer. My section carried out a beam attack to break up the enemy formation. I fired two second bursts from 400 yards, closing to 50 yards. Emmy 110s above started to dive on us, but climbed rapidly again before getting in range. I climbed up again, positioning myself in the sun. I carried out another beam attack on the main formation, shooting at several, trying to break one from the formation. Miller was now approaching the south coast. I then saw three enemy aircraft three to four thousand feet below the main formation. I carried out a beam attack on the middle one, firing the rest of my ammunition. Blue 2 also fired at this machine, which crashed west of Bournemouth. Three of the crew bailed out. One Heinkel flew low over Poole Harbour, machine gunning, but by then I had run out of ammunition. Safely back at Middle Wallop, 
Mick Miller and his fellow 609 pilots were jubilant. The other squadrons were equally happy, claiming a total of 19 shot down and 14 damaged. So, an incredible air battle, with the Germans seemingly suffering heavy losses. But what were the real figures? Well, the Germans sent 58 Heinkel 111s, with a long-range fighter escort of 52 ME 110s from ZG-26. So the RAF squadrons faced 110 enemy aircraft that day. However, if we look at the Luftwaffe casualty return, it shows that only four Heinkels and two ME 110s were shot down. That's all they lost. Six aircraft, not the 19 claimed by the RAF. The first Heinkel casualty was shot down by anti-aircraft guns just before it dropped its bombs. All five men jumped by parachute and survived as their crewless bomber hit the ground near Portbury in Somerset. The second Heinkel was shot down a few minutes later by at least four fighters and crashed south of Bath. This time, only the pilot survived, and he was badly injured. Ron Little of 238 Squadron saw it go down. I saw the enemy aircraft go into a dive straight down and went nose first into the ground where it burst into flames. I circled round and saw a Spitfire crash into the next field, but did not catch fire. That Spitfire landed about 200 yards from the bomber. Its pilot was a 20-year-old Australian, Kenneth Holland. People from Wolverton Village ran to help him out, but found him sitting motionless in his cockpit. A single bullet had struck him in the head and killed him instantly. Ken Holland's commanding officer, squadron leader Peter Devitt, was also hit by return fire. I put the undercarriage up and did a belly landing. I had just time to think to myself, that wasn't too bad, when alongside the cockpit a woman appeared. Where the hell she came from I had no idea, but what was even more extraordinary was that she had a cup of tea in her hand. The next aircraft to fall was one of the escorting Messerschmitts. The pilot, Walter Scherer, stayed with the plane to save his gunner's life, but almost died in the crash landing. His gunner was already dead. This photo shows his aircraft on display to the public a few weeks later. The third Heinkel to come down that day was the one in McMillan's camera gun film. It crashed into a house called Chatsworth in Westminster Road, Branksom Park. There was only one survivor, 21-year-old Carl Schraps, the wireless operator, so this must be him on his parachute in the film. This rare photograph shows the Chatsworth house the following day as the investigators sifted through the rubble. Eighty years on, the site has been completely redeveloped, but the name has been kept. The only features that remain of the original house are the stone gateposts. The last Heinkel to be shot down that day was actually chased all the way over Paul Harbour by 609 Squadron. It ended up forced landing near Swanage, right in front of a group of men who had a camera. In this first photo, you can see that the aircraft has just come to a halt. There's still smoke rising from it. A few seconds later, and you can just see the crew starting to get out of the aircraft. There's a man on the wing if you look closely. This one was taken probably a couple of minutes later because now you can see that the crew are all gathered around the front of the aircraft along with some British soldiers and they're tending to a very wounded comrade. Again a few more minutes later and you can now see that the crew and the soldiers are carrying their comrade over the fence towards the farmhouse in the extreme left of the picture. And finally at the scene of the crash you can actually see now the white bull motif which was very very unusual painted on the side of this Heinkel. What was also interesting about this bomber is that it had completely black undersides as it had been operating at night for the few days before. The surviving German crew members were lucky to be alive, but there was a tragic end to this day's combat, as Simon discovered when he visited the spot where the Heinkel came down near Swanich. It slid to a halt just between these power lines. Now sometime afterwards, when the RAF came to salvage the aircraft, the crane that they were using struck these very power lines. It killed two of the crew and badly injured the third man. The effects of the raid were felt by families far and wide. But what of McMiller? 
Was he still flying his trusty Spitfire X4107? The next we hear from him is two days later on the 27th of September, where his good friend David Crook takes up the story. I was flying just behind Mick, and he turned slightly left to attack an ME-110, which was coming towards him. But the German was as determined as Mick, and refused to give way or alter course to avoid this head-on attack. Their aggregate speed of closing was at least 600 miles an hour, and an instant later they collided. There was a terrific explosion, and a great sheet of flame and black smoke seemed to hang in the air like a great ball of fire. Many little fragments fluttered down, and that was all. Mick was killed instantly, and hardly a trace was ever found. brilliantly you flew for such short years. Roger, across the small horizon of my life, like laughter born on shining wings, now you have sped into the sun, and stand ennobled in proud robes of flame. We can no longer see you, for the light that clothes you is too fine a fire for our dull, ordinary eyes. But every day we shall remember you in the brave glory of the golden sun.